Okay, so let's start with the thyroid system. Um, I've drawn a little bit of a schematic here. It's a bit oversimplified, and it's also at the same time a little bit messy, so I'm going to try to explain it, and hopefully it makes sense. You have uh, the thyroid gland. This is the thing that sits in front of uh, your larynx. Uh, you can actually feel the thyroid gland, and uh, it's shaped as a shield, which is how it gets its name. And the thyroid gland is regulated directly uh, via a hormone called TSH. So TSH is stimulated from the anterior portion of the pituitary gland, and it tells the thyroid gland to make T4 and T3. And the pituitary gland is regulated upstream by the hypothalamus, which stimulates it via a hormone called TRH. Now, I'll come back to the regulation of these in a moment, but let's just go back to the thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland makes mostly T4 and a little bit of T3. Now, where do the three and the four come from? What are they referring to? Well, they're referring to the number of iodines that are in the molecule. So not surprisingly, T4 has four iodines, T3 has three iodines. What's the difference between them? The difference has to do with their biologic activity. When you think of all the things that the thyroid hormone does, for example, how it keeps you warm, aids in metabolism, uh, controls things like the brittleness of your nails, your hair, uh, bowel function, all sorts of things. All of the thyroid promoting functions are controlled by the active version, which is T3. T4, conversely, is the inactive version of the hormone. So if you're paying attention to what I just said, you'll note I just said that basically most of what comes out of the thyroid is T4, which is inactive. Now, it's not entirely clear what the ratio is between these, but it's directionally about four or five to one. I think it's almost just as easy to imagine that virtually everything the thyroid is producing is T4. So if the thyroid is producing T4, which is inactive, it needs to be converted into an active hormone in the body. And that's where these enzymes called deiodinases come in. And as their name suggests, deiodinases remove one of the iodines from T4 to create T3, which is the active hormone. Now, the story gets a little bit more complicated because there are different types of deiodinases. But the three most relevant are D1, D2, and D3. So let's talk for a moment about these three deiodinases. D1 and D2 are quite similar in that they both convert T4 into T3. More about that in a moment. It's just where they do it that's slightly different. D1 is extracellular. It's on the cell membrane facing outward, whereas D2 is on the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, and it's facing internal to the cytosol. But put that aside for a moment and just keep in mind that D1 and D2 both convert T4 into the active hormone T3. This is the one that has all of the you know, positive effects of thyroid hormone. Now, D3 is different in that D3 takes T4 and makes something called reverse T3. Reverse T3 is very similar to T3, except for a very important difference, which is it doesn't activate the receptor that T3 activates. So it occupies the receptor without activating it. So in effect, you can think of reverse T3 as anti-T3. It basically blocks the effects of T3. Now, it sounds like a very bad idea to have reverse T3 floating around, and unfortunately, in the modern world, it often is. It usually is a sign of inflammation, illness, or things of that nature. But I think that the reason it probably exists is to cope with shortage of nutrients. In other words, when nutrients are scarce, when you need to slow down metabolism, one of the first things that the body does is it increases the production of reverse T3 to block the effects of T3. In fact, one of the things I used to notice when I did frequent fasting, because I would fast for say a week at a time, and I would always check my blood pre and post, is how much my thyroid function deteriorated during that period of time. And it wasn't just a deterioration in the usual metrics such as TSH, uh, and T4, it was how much my free T3 and reverse T3 changed. In fact, the ratio of my free T3 to reverse T3 might go from 0.25, which is pretty normal, to 0.05 or less in just a five to seven day fast. And, you know, I would say about half of that was due to the reduction in T3, and the majority of that was due to the increase in reverse T3. 
So the body is going to regulate these three enzymes in response to various physiologic circumstances. And that's effectively at the cellular level how the body is controlling thyroid function. Now this creates a bit of a problem when you want to evaluate a patient for their thyroid status. Because the traditional way to think about a patient's thyroid status is actually just to look at their TSH. And on the surface, this kind of makes sense because if everything is working perfectly, the TSH should give you the answer. If the TSH is very high, what must be true? Well, there must not be much T3 around because it would be inhibiting TSH. If TSH is very, very low, you would be getting a lot of inhibition from these things. You would be in a hyperthyroid state. The reality of it is you can sometimes have a normal TSH and still have the symptoms of hypothyroidism. If, for example, you have very high amounts of reverse T3 and very low amounts of T3. In other words, if your T4 is being preferentially shunted into reverse T3 instead of T3, you might feel like you have the symptoms of hypothyroidism. You could be cold, your metabolism might be slow, you'd have difficulty sleeping. If it were really extreme, your nails might even get brittle, you'd be constipated. These sorts of, unfortunately, nonspecific uh, symptoms which make it difficult to make such a diagnosis at times. So where does this matter when it comes to how we treat hypothyroidism? And to be clear, hypothyroidism is far more common than hyperthyroidism. I'm not gonna talk about hyperthyroidism, I'm gonna talk about hypo. The standard treatment for hypothyroidism is to give T4. We give a synthetic version of this hormone, the inactive thyroid hormone. And we do that with the knowledge that most patients will convert that T4 via D1 and D2 into T3. The T3 will go on to have all the biologic effects and it will also suppress TRH and TSH and the body will come back into line. So for example, if a patient shows up to see you and they have the classic symptoms of hypothyroidism and their TSH is elevated, for example, it's six or seven, you might give them say 75 micrograms of T4 and you might expect to come back and see that TSH at two or three and them feeling better. And many times it works out that way, but unfortunately it doesn't always work out that way. And in fact, what you see sometimes is that you give a patient T4 and they start to feel worse. And sometimes their TSH actually improves. And the reason it improves is T4 does have some inhibition of TSH, not as much as T3, but some. But what if, for physiologic reasons, their D1 and D2 are being downregulated while their D3 is being upregulated, and they're taking that T4 that you're giving them and they're just making more and more reverse T3. Now, a person who's insulin resistant, a person who has low-grade inflammation, these are typically things that we, we might see drive that state. And that patient, even though their TSH improves, doesn't necessarily feel better. And for those patients, it might make more sense to actually give them T3. Because if you give T3, you're basically bypassing this system altogether. You're still getting the feedback that's appropriate, but you bypass the step where the body might erroneously turn the T4 into reverse T3. Now, there's a bit of a problem in giving T3 because the uh, regular version of T3, a drug called Cytomel, is a very difficult drug for patients to tolerate. When I was in training, uh, we would give T3 to patients after we did thyroidectomies on them for thyroid cancer, and patients could rarely tolerate it. Uh, we had to give it to them because we would immediately take all of their thyroid out in one moment, and they needed a big dose of T4, but a hefty dose of T3 to get them over the hump, and oftentimes they would feel pretty lousy from that. Now, since that time, uh, I think T3 has largely fallen out of favor. Not many doctors use Cytomel, uh, which is the uh, trade name for T3, because it is so rapid in its onset. Instead, uh, people are typically using two other formulations. The first is a compounded control release T3. So it's the exact same hormone T3, but it's just compounded in a way 
to be slowly released. This seems to be much more well tolerated, and the doses can be pushed a little bit higher. A typical dose might be anywhere from 10 to 25 or even 30 micrograms of control release T3, and that seems to last a patient throughout the day. Of course, they have to take this generally in the morning to make sure that it's out of their system by evening, or at least it's reduced in potency. There's another way that patients uh, often receive T3, and that's in combination with T4 vis-a-vis -a, -vis a formulation known as desiccated thyroid. Now, desiccated thyroid is basically whole thyroid gland, and therefore it contains T4, T3, and even some T2, but we're not going to talk about that. So the two most common versions of desiccated thyroid are a formulation called Nature Throid and Armor Thyroid. So if you're watching this video and you're interested in this topic, you've undoubtedly heard of these things. Now, I'm not going to get into the religious debates about this stuff. There are really competing schools of thought, and there are some people that believe that the only thing that should ever be given to any patient with hypothyroidism is a desiccated formulation. Similarly, there are other people who think all of that desiccated stuff is total crap and it should never be given and we should only be giving T4 or we should only be giving T4 with a little bit of T3 or you should only be giving control release T3. I interacted with people from all of these schools and all I can say is if you're really interested in treating hypothyroidism, you better know all of them because there are some patients in whom one way works and another way doesn't. I've had patients who came to me on desiccated formulations and I thought, you know, I don't really like these desiccated formulations. I'm going to switch them over to T4 plus control release T3 and I could never get them right and I ultimately end up putting them on desiccated and getting them right. Similarly, I get patients that show up on desiccated and they sort of feel okay but they're not quite right and we get them feeling right in other ways. Now keep in mind, if you're giving desiccated thyroid, and this is kind of the reason why I don't generally like to use it, except when it works, uh, you're giving a fixed amount of T4 and T3. You don't get to control it. The ratio is set, and it's something like 1 to 4.2 or something like that, meaning for every unit of T3 you're giving, you're giving 4.2 two units or micrograms of T4. And again, for some patients, that's just right. But there are other patients who need more or less of one or the other. And that's why I tend to use T4 and T3 separately. But again, you're here to fix the symptoms more than you're here to fix the numbers. And you'll ultimately end up using whatever works. Finally, a word on half-life. T4 has a very long half-life. It's a matter of days. And for that reason, a patient shouldn't panic if they miss a day of T4. So if they forget their dose of T4, it's okay. Just take it the next day and don't double up. Conversely, T3 has a much shorter half-life. And therefore, you do need to stay on top of your T3 when you give it. Now, of course, remember the control release and the immediate release T3 also have very different half-lives. But what I'm referring to is endogenous T3 as well. So there you have it, a pretty hopefully simple overview of the thyroid system. I guess one of the takeaways from this is that it's a little more complicated than you might be led to believe if your doctor is only looking at your TSH. And unfortunately, when you go to the doctor's office, a lot of the times that's the only lab they've ordered. I prefer to order not just the TSH, but the free T4, the free T3, and the reverse T3 if I have any concerns about hypothyroidism. I don't always order this blood test. So if the TSH is normal, the T3, T4 are normal, and the patient is asymptomatic, I'm not looking at their reverse T3. But if a patient has symptoms and you need to investigate them, I think you have to understand all of these. And what you're basically doing is using the amounts of T4 or free T4, T3 or free T3, reverse T3 to impute what the action is of these diodinases and therefore what your treatment strategy needs to be.